Virtually no Englishman had ever seen the Chesapeake Bay. A few people connected to the Roanoke Venture had glimpsed it years before, but most English people had only seen it in paintings by John White, if that. A few French people had done some fur trading there, and the Spanish had briefly made contact with the local people, but that's important and we'll get to it later. The English, though, mostly hung out in the Caribbean, Newfoundland, and New England. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. In the early 17th century, though, a few people decided to set up a colony on the shores of the Chesapeake, and on December 20th, 1606, a trio of ships sailed for Virginia. Under the command of Captain Christopher Newport, 104 settlers and 40 crew left London for the unknown. By the time they reached Virginia, a voyage that had taken four months instead of the usual two, John Smith was under arrest. Accusations and finger-pointing ran wild to the point the company had split into factions before even losing the sight of the English shore. Conditions among the settlers seemed so troubling that a group of colonists immediately jumped ship and decided to take their chances living with the Indians. So how did we get here? Let's back up. The Virginia venture had started when a small group of people, including Bartholomew Gosnold, Edward Maria Wingfield, John Smith, and Gabriel Archer started recruiting settlers and investors for a colony in North America, and soon they had picked up enough steam to back up their venture with a patent, a charter, and a joint stock company called the Virginia Company. This they did with the help of Sir Thomas Smythe, one of the founders of the East India Company. They needed a joint stock company because there was no one associated with the company who was rich enough to fund the voyage. There could be no private patent similar to Sir Walter Raleigh's. The London Company would help set company policies, would advocate on the colony's behalf at James's court, would recruit settlers, and most importantly of all, it would raise the money needed to keep the colony going. It would also be easier to keep the colony a secret if it were managed by a joint stock company, which was important because Spain was willing to reignite war with England to destroy the colony if it proved a threat. The Virginia Company helped recruit enough settlers to round out those recruited by the first movers, and it chose the captain who would take them to the New World. Its choice was Christopher Newport, the one-armed veteran of the fight with the Armada who had been to the Chesapeake in John White's search for the lost colonists and had done privateering in the Caribbean. When James had signed a peace treaty with Spain and forbade privateering, Newport met equal success doing legal trade. No one could doubt his credentials, but he was certainly given oddly favorable terms for his participation in the venture. Unlike most colonists, Newport would be given ownership of land, and he wouldn't have to give any money or recruit any servants from his estates to participate in it. As plans to settle Virginia developed, James's privy councillor, Robert Cecil, the first Earl of Salisbury, had become involved. Cecil was a key figure in the discovery of the gunpowder plot, and if you remember from our prologue, he was the person who strongly advocated for closer relations with Spain. Though no one knew this at the time, he was also in the paid employment of Spain. Soon, Cecil had pushed a few of his own people into the venture for mysterious reasons. The Virginia Company was completely out of the hands of the first movers at this point in time, and when the Susan Constant, the Godspeed in the Discovery, set sail from London, Newport was given the list of colony leaders in a sealed box with instructions not to open it until he reached the shores of, of Virginia. <sighs> this was an odd order, and it's hard to know exactly why the company made that decision. Maybe it was to prevent people from refusing to go to Virginia when they found out that they weren't chosen for leadership, and maybe it was to prevent infighting en route to Virginia. Whatever the reason, the practical effect that it had was to increase suspicion among the settlers and to help increase tensions to a breaking point. People 
already came to the Virginia venture with vastly different backgrounds and ideas, and four months on a ship with mysterious orders and even more mysterious interlopers did not help matters. Accusations started to fly. Smith accused Wingfield and Percy of being little better than atheists because they were hostile to the Reverend Hunt's godly exhortations. Side note here, when you hear godly used at this time period, think Puritan. It didn't mean religious back then. Kind of like how today we understand the terms pro-life and pro-choice to refer to specific political views, though the terms themselves refer to values that most of us would say we hold. Hunt was Puritan-leaning. Smith aspired to be a Christian warrior. And pretty much every gentleman on the company considered Smith to be a commoner with pretensions above his station, though he was very happy to point out that he was technically a gentleman too, and one with a fair amount more money than most of those people had. Wingfield and Percy accused Hunt of having left England because he engaged in impropriety with a servant and shirked his duties. Wingfield in Newport, meanwhile, accused Smith of plotting a mutiny along with conspirators on all three ships to usurp the government, murder the council, and make himself king of the colony. Smith was arrested, and while stopping on Nevis, he was only spared execution by the intervention of Hunt and Gosnold. Finally, four months after leaving, the group finally glimpsed the wooded shore of the Chesapeake Bay. Tall trees, lush foliage, and abundant wildlife were like stepping into another world. They left a destitute and crowded city, spent four months on a smelly, overcrowded boat, and finally they were at their destination, a land even as God made it. As they disembarked, though, a group of Indians appeared out of nowhere and started shooting. Captain Archer was injured in both his hands, and one sailor was injured in, quote, life-threatening places. It's also around this time that the first group of people, who were known as the Renegades, jumped ship to join the Indians. William White was their leader, but still things seemed promising. That night, they opened the names of the colony's leaders, and there were a couple of surprises on the list, perhaps unsurprisingly given what we already know. This is also a good time to introduce you briefly to the leaders who helped shape Jamestown's early history. Their faction fighting came to define the colony in this time period, and it's just better that you have a brief idea of who's who before we move forward. Newport, who we already know, was given sole control of the colony whenever he was there. No surprise there, his position in the company was made clear before anyone left London. When Newport wasn't there, the colony would be led by a seven-man council, and the council would elect a president every year. The president and the council were to try to cooperate, but if they couldn't agree on an issue, it would be decided by a vote, with a simple majority to win, and the president would get two votes. The president could be removed by the majority of the council. The first man... Named to the council was Bartholomew Gosnold. No surprise here either. Gosnold had participated in numerous colonial ventures and had tried to plant a colony in modern Maine. He had named Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard, but the colony had failed, though he was able to gather a cargo of cedar and sassafras. Today, he's recognized as the man most responsible for England settling North America. Back then, he was recognized as the man most able to rise above the faction fighting to guide the colony and minimize conflict. Everybody knew him, everyone liked him, everyone respected him, and he didn't get pulled into petty squabbles. He was the person who had first had the idea for the Virginia colony, and he was the man who had first recruited people for it. His name had been erased from all documentation when Cecil had discovered some negative remarks that Gosnold had made about King James at a dinner party but he was still a leader. Edward Maria Wingfield was related to Gosnold and was another one of the so-called first movers. He had been a POW in Flanders, and he had first become interested in colonization when he met Ralph Lane in Ireland. Wingfield's family had supported Mary Tudor, and he was her godson. Obviously, they were a Catholic family, though his cousin had also participated in the Protestant-leaning Essex Rebellion at the end of Elizabeth's reign. Wingfield himself seemed to not have any religious leanings one way or another, and at the very least he kept them very quiet. This means that if he did have any religious leanings, 
he was definitely a Catholic. Again, with his early actions in the colony and his relationship to Gosnold, Wingfield made sense as a council member. This is where it gets weird, because the fourth member on the council was a man that no one knew anything about. His name was John Ratcliffe, and he was obviously there because Cecil had put him there. No one knew why, no one knew who he was, and no one trusted him. He and Kendall were the two people whose presence in the venture the Virginia Company had deemed non-negotiable, and he'd even been given command of the Godspeed while Newport commanded the flagship Susan Constant and Gosnold captained the Discovery. And now, he wasn't just on the council, he was one of the four most prominent members. Perhaps unsurprisingly at this point, Kendall was also on the council, Cecil also had a spy named Brewster in the colony, possibly related to the William Brewster who helped found Plymouth, but they couldn't all be on the council. Another council member was Captain John Martin. He was the son of the London mayor, master of the Royal Mint, and a former privateer who had sailed with Sir Francis Drake on the mission to pick up Lane's men in Roanoke. This made him one of the oldest people there, and he was in his mid-40s while the others, including his son, were mostly in their 20s and early 30s. The last person on the council was John Smith. Smith wasn't popular, and he was considered, like I said, by many of the colony's leaders to be a commoner with pretensions above his station, but he had been one of the first movers of the colony, and Bartholomew Gosnold had recommended that he be put on the council. Smith had been a soldier fighting the Ottomans for the Holy Roman Empire, and he was brought up and he was brought into the venture by someone who knew both Wingfield and Gosnold. Smith was still under arrest, though, and the council didn't let him take his place. In addition to the two people who were mysteriously left on the council, there were two notable people who had been left off. The first was Captain Gabriel Archer, and he was furious. No one really knew why he had been left off. He had participated in Gosnold's previous colonizing expedition and had even written the most important account of that voyage and helped people understand the land and people that they encountered by making common sense comparisons with English examples. He had become one of the first movers of the Jamestown Project because of his connection to Gosnold. He was a Cambridge-educated lawyer, and by all measures, he should have been included. He was known for his intelligence, he was known for his quick wit and his skill with words, and because of that, he actually did a lot of the early location naming in Virginia, with some, like Cape Comfort, being puns. He also suggested the name James Fort instead of Jamestown for the settlement's names, a play on the name Chelmsford, which, is, which was a town in England that the Puritans disapproved of. The hostility to the Puritans is because Archer was a Catholic, the son of people who were persecuted for their Catholic faith, and a lawyer at the time that Catholics weren't allowed to practice law. This Catholicism became the topic of conversation just a couple years ago because Archer's body was found buried with a relic. The other notable exemption was George Percy, but unlike Archer, he wasn't surprised at all to be left off of the council. He was the highest ranking nobleman there, but his brother was in the Tower of London for his participation in the gunpowder plot. His brother wasn't executed, though, because the death of his cousin in the same plot meant that they couldn't prove the extent of his brother's involvement. In addition, his father had died in the Tower for his participation in a plot to try to break Mary, Queen of Scots, out of the tower, and his uncle had been executed for leading the Rising of the North to try to put Mary, Queen of Scots, on the throne. What's more, his grandfather had been executed for his leadership in the Pilgrimage of Grace against Henry VIII. Less related, but while I'm on the subject, his ancestor, Henry Hotspur, Percy, had been killed in a rebellion against Henry IV, and Hotspur's uncle was executed for his position for his participation in that rebellion. The Percys weren't just Catholic, though open Catholicism seemed to be enough to disqualify Archer. The Percys were diehard rebels, and this meant that there was very little chance that George Percy was going to find his way anywhere near power in Jamestown. 
He didn't particularly want power anyway, though. He could be distinguished by his lineage without having to resort to politics. He was an epileptic and the youngest of eight children who had lived beyond the means of his modest inheritance in England and had used his extravagance to demonstrate his social status. Percy had lived in the Caribbean for a while to try to improve his health, and he had spent some time in Ireland. His brother, who was currently in the power, had paid for his voyage to America. You can see a very strong Catholic presence in this venture, which is very interesting, because if you listened to the prologue, you know that the Catholics were persecuted in England at this time, and that the nobility were more than twice as likely to be Catholics as the general population. Both Kendall and Ratcliffe had Catholic and gunpowder plot connections, but we'll get to that later. Wingfield was elected president. He later noted that he feared only two rivals in the colony, Archer, who would take power if he could, and Gosnold, who could if he would. But all that out of the way, they started to explore. They erected a cross at Cape Henry, named in honor of James's beloved 13-year-old heir, and they started to make contact with the local people, and they started to look for a suitable location to start the colony, following company directions and avoiding offending the locals. They received a warm welcome from the Kikatans, Paspahes, and Quiocahonics, and they were especially impressed by the latter's chief, Chopak. After some deliberation, they decided on Jamestown Island as a location. It was 50 miles from the coast, so it was unlikely to be surprised by Spanish warships, but it could also be easily defended against hostile Indians, and ships could easily land there. The Paspahe owned the land, but they considered it worthless, a swamp with bad water that was only good for hunting deer. The first significant encounter with the local peoples came as they were setting up camp. The Werewanse, or tribal leader of the Paspahe, came to their camp with a hundred guards. The English refused to put down their weapons, but the Werewanse granted them the land as a peacemaking gesture. This relieved tension until one settler found a hatchet missing, and this led to a brawl, and the chief left angrily. But two days later, he returned with a deer carcass as a peace offering. The English and the Paspahe started to communicate to try to get to know each other. Part of this involved a shooting demonstration. Leaning a wooden shield against a tree, they took turns shooting at it. The, pa the Paspahe were impressed by the gun technology, but the English were equally impressed by Indian accuracy. And to see the fact that an Indian arrow could completely penetrate the shield where their bullets had only lodged an inch or two into the wood. It was a friendly meeting and colonists were beginning to settle into their new routines and their new surroundings. It was now May 1607, and the colony had planned to have Newport return with the first supply mission by May. They had given the settlers supplies based on this assumption and erring on the side of stinginess, but the long voyage had pushed the timeline back. In addition, Newport and the company both benefited more from Newport's exploring to find valuables than his crossing the Atlantic to pick up food. The long-term success of the mission depended on finding some way to make the colony worth investing in, and Newport could not return to England without evidence of something worthwhile, so while the settlers were eager for Newport to leave, Newport took 20 men, including Smith, Percy, and Archer, up the James River. This mission, as it started, epitomized the romance of exploration. They sailed in their pinnace up the James River in a land overgrown with foliage, with birds filling the trees, and peaceful peoples with beautiful cultures. A man Archer dubbed the Kind Consort followed them in a canoe until they agreed to let him be their guide, and he led them to village after village of people who welcomed them into their towns, fed them, and were eager to trade. At one point, the kind consort was drawing a map with his toe, and Archer offered him a pen. This was a cultural moment. It was sharing, it was feasting, it was talking, it was listening. They watched beautiful dances, and Percy, who was trained in the arts, noted that the dances were actually very precise. They moved their upper bodies individually, but their feet moved to the same beat. The principles and understanding of dance transcended cultures, and 
he did worry that they were worshipping the devil at times, but they were very impressive people. They sat around fires in village huts and they learned of the Powhatan Wahun Seneca, and who was the Mamanatoic or the leader of the entire empire of Tsinakamoko. The women were warm and feminine and beautiful, and the men were big and strong and impressive. Finally, they met the person that they believed to be Powhatan, the leader of the Powhatan nation. They referred to Wahun Seneca as Powhatan because of a sort of a misunderstanding of the language. And this belief that this person was Powhatan was also partially the result of a misunderstanding, but it was partially the result of the people sort of misleading them. But the English sat down with the Werewanse, who was Wahun Seneca's son, Parahunt, and they talked. Archer showed them the... Archer showed Parahunt the injuries in his hand, and Parahunt said that they had been inflicted by a rival Chesapeake tribe. The English said that they had vowed revenge and that that made the Powhatan and the English allies. And this was also the result of some deception because they had actually been attacked by Powhatan allies. Both sides were being careful, though, and the initial meetings were peaceful and promising. Archer befriended an Indian named Navarons, who taught him some Algonquin, and they decided to return the Indians' hospitality and cook a meal from the ship's rations. Before they managed to cook the meal, they found some stuff missing, and they informed the chiefs, and as soon as they found out, the chiefs ordered it to be returned, and as soon as they ordered it to be returned, every piece was given back to the English. Again, the English were very impressed, this time by the deference to authority within the culture, and as a sign of goodwill, Newport gave everything that had just been returned back to the people who stole it, except for the bullets. They also exchanged delicacies. The Indians brought tobacco and the English brought alcohol. They smoked and they drank together. Parahunt got drunk almost immediately, and he started telling them about the area, hinting at the presence of copper and the English listened intently. Like I said, both sides were playing a bit of a game here. They did mention exploring for minerals, though, and Parahunt got very serious and told them not to. He said there were enemy monikins occupying the land around the falls. And in response to this, the English offered to send men to help fight the monikins, and Parahunt was very happy. The English and the Indians parted ways for the time being, except for Navarons who accompanied them. This was everything they could have dreamed that America would be. The English wanted to distinguish their Protestant country's conversion efforts from those of Catholic Spain by being friendly with the Indians instead of acting as conquerors. Their time in the Caribbean had confirmed the superiority of their ways, and they didn't actually consider the Indians inferior. Both England and Germany, which was now the greatest Protestant civilization, had been barbaric before the Romans changed them, giving them law and religion and civilization, and now the English would pass it on and do the same for the Indians. This was the common idea at the time, so common that even John Locke mentioned this. And the English actually noted places where Indian culture was superior. This deference to authority, the femininity of the women, and the care which the women took with their children was all stuff that was not as pronounced in English culture, but which the English were very impressed by. When they reached the other end of the James River, they erected a second cross with the inscription Jacobus Rex, which proclaimed James King of the Region. Navarons got very uncomfortable when he saw this, but Newport told him that it was a sign of peace and unity between their peoples. Navarons was unconvinced and told Parahunt when they returned to his village, and Parahunt was angry, but Newport's explanation reassured him, and Parahunt ended up rebuking his own people. 
Why should you be offended with them as long as they hurt you not, nor take away anything by force? He asked. They take but a little waste ground which doth you nor any of us any good. Pear Hunt was less impressed, though, when he fell ill. He blamed the drinks the English had given him, and he thought that he'd been poisoned. Newport confidently predicted that he would feel better in the morning, and when this proved true, Pear Hunt ordered venison to be given to the visitors. A woman came up to Archer and put leaves on his hands, and they started to resume their exploration of the area and the peoples. They met a female chief, who they dubbed the Indian Elizabeth, and they did similar firearms demonstrations as they had with the Paspahe. Soon they were led to another town, which Archer mockingly dubbed Pamunky Palace, though Navarons told him that that was inappropriate. There, they were met by an older warrior who was clearly the head of his tribe. He showed them pearls and copper, and the English pretended to be unimpressed while asking what else was in their kingdom. He said that there were lots of deer, that this was true of all the kingdoms. This was Opikonganu, the brother of Wahun Seneca, and it's with him that the Spanish enter our story. Because in the 1570s, the Spanish had explored the Chesapeake Bay, and they had taken a young native back to Spain to live with them, to learn about their culture, and to be converted. The Spanish named him Don Luis, and he had lived in Spain for 11 years, and he repeatedly asked to go home, but they wouldn't let him lest he return to his pagan ways. But... When Don Luis said that he wanted to go home to convert his people, they agreed. On his way back to Virginia, they took him on a tour of their colonial possessions, especially to Mexico, and they sent a group of missionaries to accompany them. Once they reached Virginia, he left them, returning only as a leader of his tribe, leading a group of warriors and killing them all. We don't know exactly who Don Luis was. We do know that he was a Powhatan Werewanse or Mamanatoic. Some descendants of the Mataponi tribe believe that he was Wahun Seneca himself, but the Chickahominy strongly indicated that he w- that Don Luis was Opikongineo. Their name for Don Luis was Paquiquineo, and they said that Opikongineo had come from far to the south. He was Wahun Seneca's brother, and he was the Werewanse of the Pramunki tribe under Wahun Seneca's Powhatan Empire. Opikonganu also had a decidedly different approach to the English from that of most of the Native Americans. Soon after leaving Opikonganu, Navarance's attitude changed dramatically. The English began to worry about what was going on at Jamestown and returned to the settlement as fast as possible. When they arrived, the colony was in disarray, having been attacked two days before. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd appreciate if you'd rate and subscribe to the show. And you can also visit my website at AmericanHistoryPodcast.net or connect with me on social media.